This is Anthony Priscilla working with inverse functions with this college algebra class today. And remember that first of all, let's recall that we had said that a function is a rule which assigns to each x value only one, exactly one, y value. Uh, when looking at ordered pairs, we said functions uh, have no repeated x value. Well, the first thing we're going to do is define a, uh, what we mean by a one-to-one -one function. A one-to-one -one function has no repeated y values. No repeated y values. Okay? A function has no repeated x values. A one-to-one -one function has no repeated y values. When we uh, look at a graph and try to decide, is this graph one-to-one, -one, we're asking ourselves, are there any repeated y values? So if we had, say, a slanted line, it asks, is this function one-to-one? Well, we know it's a function because it passes the vertical line test. So to decide if this is a one-to-one -one function, you're going to ask yourself, okay, if we drew a horizontal line through the graph, the horizontal lines cross it more than once. This is sort of like the vertical line test. If a vertical line crosses a graph more than once, it's not a function. If a horizontal line crosses, the horizontal line crosses uh, the graph of a function, more than once the function is not one to one and that's referred to as the horizontal line test if a horizontal line can be drawn to cross a function a graph more than once then the graph of that function is not one to one excuse me, then that function is not one-to-one. -one. Number one, is this a one-to-one -one function? No. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Notice the horizontal lines are only crossing at once. Number two, same instructions, decide if this is one-to-one. -one. And this little thing here, we're assuming it's going up. Don't assume it turns around. If it turned around, then you'd have repeated y values. So this one is another one-to-one -one function. On number three, if you drew horizontal lines, again, we're assuming this is going to continue going up, not that it's going to turn around. So this one is also one-to-one. Well, it's unfortunate these three examples right off are all one-to-one. -one. So let's think um, of something we craft earlier, uh, a few days ago. What about quadratic functions? Here's a question. The quadrat or quadratic functions one-to-one. -one. Oops, my motion detector just sent the lights off. Example, here's a question. Are quadratic functions one-to-one? -one? Remember, a quadratic function looks like a, well, it's a parabola opening up or down. So just draw any, just look at any type of, here, I'm just going to draw this. Here's a parabola opening up 
And is this thing one-to-one -one or not? Hmm. Is this a one-to-one -one function? Well, right off, right here, here are two y values, excuse me, two points with the same y value. If we think of this as the x-axis and the y-axis, so do these, does this pass the horizontal line test? Well, no. Notice, you can certainly draw horizontal lines that intersect at more than once. Quadratic functions are not one-to-one. -one. Okay? Doesn't matter if it's opening up or down. Sometimes students say, well, what if it's opening left or right? If it were opening left or right, remember, that wouldn't be a function. Okay? Now, let's see. Oh, here's some more terminology. Uh, an inverse is formed by interchanging or switching. Let's say switching the x and y values of a function. Oh, that's an inverse is formed by switching the x and y coordinates. This is not a very formal definition. I'm not saying it is. It's a very casual definition. And we'll define inverses much better, a much more formal definition in a little bit. Okay? But if we look at problem number four, it's asking us, Okay, are these inverse functions? No, excuse me. Yeah, are f and g inverses of each other? Well, an inverse switches the x and y. So you look through here and see, okay, are they just switching the x and y? And on this one, yeah. Every now and then, when it regenerates, just because my answer here is, Yes, doesn't mean yours will be. They change up the numbers some, and sometimes they're not inverses. An inverse function should just be switching the x and y's. So the answer to 4 here is yes, these are inverses. Now, Let's do another one like that. Let's do number nine. Nine and ten. It just says, are these functions, there, number nine, are f and g inverse functions? So you look at f and c. Are they just switching x and y? And yes. Again, just because my number nine is yes doesn't mean yours will be. Don't know what's going on with this motion for this light uh, sensor. It's going crazy today. It keeps flipping off. Now, number 10, this is an interesting one. It says, if the following defines a one-to-one -one inverse, I mean function, find its inverse. If not, write not one to one. So it says, okay, if it's one to one, find its inverse. Well, let's remember our definition of one to one. A one to one function has no repeated values. Excuse me, no repeated y values, okay? No repeated y values. So let's see, is this thing one to one? Are there any y values being repeated? No, so this one is one to one. So it says, if it's one to one, find its inverse. So you're just gonna go through and switch the ordered pairs. Negative 16, negative 20, 18, negative five, negative 13, negative 11. And then let's see, look really close. Uh, B and C look sort of similar. I'm thinking it, at least they start off similar. It's B. Let's 
how still a few more like that. Look at 11. It says, if it's one to one, find its inverse. Well, why is it saying if it's one to one? Well, look right here. Here are two repeated y values. So that means this is not one to one. The common mistake that students will make is they'll say, oh, C is the answer. But the problem with that, why is it saying if it's one to one, find its inverse? Well, right here, if you look at this answer C, that's not a function. The original function must be one to one in order for its inverse to be a function. You see here there's repeated x's. Remember we said a function has no repeated x values. Right here. A function has no repeated x values. The reason that we're saying that an inverse must have or must be one to one in order for us to find its inverse function is because if there are repeated y values then when you switch the x and y you'll have repeated x values so don't you see is the answer here we only want our inverses to be functions just like the original function number 12 same type, if it's one to one, find the inverse. Well, looking at the y's, there are no repeated y's. So it is one to one. So just switch the x and y. Which of these switches the x and y? This one right here. Just switch the x. Notice, when you look at this inverse, it is a function. No x values are being repeated. We want the function and its inverse to both be functions. Okay? We want this, uh, we want an inverse function. Now, this idea of switching x and y has sort of uh, leads us to some statements here. Okay, fill in the blank. The domain of f, the way we're switching the x and y. Notice how this x became a y. This y became an x. So the domain of f is equal to the range of f inverse and the range of f, those y values, became x values. The way we say that formally, the range of f is equal to the domain of f inverse. So you interchange x and y. That's how you find the inverses. And by doing that, the x became a y, the y became an x. So we can state that formally. The domain of f is equal to the range of f inverse. The range of f is equal to the domain of f inverse. If someone comes up to you today and says, say something algebraic, you can say the domain of f is equal to the range of f inverse. The range of f is equal to the domain of f inverse. And everyone will be impressed and think, oh, wow, that person's really smart. One more problem we're going to do right now. This says fill in the blank. Remember the way, uh, oh, I haven't mentioned this right here. This little minus one notation is red F inverse. So that little minus one notation is how we're going to write inverse without having to write out the word inverse over and over and over. Okay, this little f with a minus 1. It looks like a negative 1 exponent. So I'll read that as f inverse. So here, here's x, there's y. With the inverse, it's switching the x and y. So if f of negative 3 is 6, 
then F inverse of 6 equals, yeah, 3. Did y'all hear that? So with inverse functions, if we want the inverse to be a function, the original function must be one-to-one, -one, meaning no repeated y values. If there are no repeated y values, then when you flip switch the x and y, there are no repeated x's. That way we will have an inverse function. This is f inverse. That little minus 1 notation looks like an exponent. On number 11, why do we not switch them? Because it's not 1 to 1. If you actually switched them, you don't get a function. We want inverse functions. So, uh, we'll stop right there for right now. We'll pick up in a little bit de formally defining what we mean by an inverse, uh, an inverse function and discuss also a way to find an inverse if it's not written as ordered pairs, if it's written as an ordered pair, it's pretty easy to do. But what if it's not written as ordered pairs like that? What if the function is written out as an equation or a formula? f of x equals 3x plus 5 over x minus 2, something like that. Okay, so we'll discuss, continue this in a little bit. Thanks.